Right, welcome back. We have with us Usman Chohan, who's a senior economist. Thank you for being with us. Usman sir, we have talked about, you know, from time to time on this IMF and the talks are concerned. Now that the technical discussions between Pakistan, uh, Pakistan's economic team and uh, the IMF mission have concluded, what do we expect as far as moving on the negotiations are concerned and the ramifications of this particularly? Um, you know, a very, very quick, I mean, in, in the, the, the effects that we can see in the next couple of weeks, broadly speaking. Well, thank you very much for having me on your show. It's always a pleasure. You're correct to note that the technical phase of the negotiations is over and now the policy level discussions happen. So basically, the IMF had a team over and they were having a look at the data, discussions with key technical folks on our side. And uh, they raised some concerns, they raised some issues where improvement would be further required, and they also expressed their praise uh, for the progress met. So overall, my reading is that it has been a positive um, uh, encounter in terms of looking at the technicals. And now you will start to talk about the broader picture and what is required from Pakistan on certain important targets to be able to curtail the key uh, deficits that we suffer from, the fiscal deficit, the current account deficit, and so forth. So the next phase is now going towards, as we have said from our side, uh, a, a new program. And the IMF has publicly said, well, it's too early to say, but I think they're favorably disposed. Okay. And when we say favorably disposed, um, you know, do we expect, of course, we want a continuation. There's no other way. There's been, there's a broad agreement that we have to move forward with IMF. But in terms of a, perhaps a longer, a program of longer duration, are we still aiming towards that? Uh, or do you think we'll be able to get that? What are your thoughts on this? Uh, that's an excellent point. So it's not just about getting an agreement. It's also about uh, considering the duration of it, the magnitude of it, and what are the repercussions for our existing indebtedness. You're absolutely right. Now, in terms of the duration, it seems that Pakistan's side has signaled that it wants it to be a longer-term engagement. That seems to be my reading. It's not a a uh, fly-by-night sort of program in some emergency. We already went through that. Uh, that's what the extended fund facility and then the standby agreement was previously. We want something that's more lasting and that would help us, one, to uh, shore up the reserves, but it would also be very good in terms of having a driver and an overarching framework to do the meaningful reforms. You do want to have that uh, sword of Damocles that is pushing for reform because those are tough choices. So I think it's very good in that sense, too. Uh, and uh, the other thing is the magnitude. So we are hoping for something that seems to be in the 5 to 10 billion range. Now, is that a significant amount? Perhaps not. But it does help to uh, cover the, the, the requirements that are immediate. And then you can build upon that and start to build up your foreign reserves in a meaningful manner later on. So it's a stepping stone that is very important. And you're correct to note that there's broad agreement for this. Absolutely. But Usman, as far as, you know, a broad agreement, you know, bro of course we can talk about, and I'm sure that, you know, you're more um, knowledgeable as far as the technical terms are concerned, the ramifications of them overall. But to to a person, to you know, a person who's not very, um, you know, uh, economically savvy, let's say, how, what are the effects as far as, for example, inflation? Do you see it going down now? Do you, do you think it's going to take further, a long time? Of course, international trends in sight. Um, what, what, are the, what is the way forward for Pakistan? You know, we talk about, of course, we have someone like Mariam Nawaz who, you know, in place as far as CM Punjab is concerned. And, you know, of course, we, we saw how, you know, roti being... Uh, 20 rupees and, and making sure that there's a baseline there. You know, those are considerations for the government also and very important considerations. Do you see a trickle down effect on those things also? Oh, it's a very difficult question and it doesn't matter how economically savvy one is, it's very complex to, to forecast and to comment on in a sober manner because you are correct to note that inflation is coming down. That is in terms of the consumer price index. But at the same time, there will be measures taken as part of this program that will increase the consumption requirements, the household incidence of spending, which means there will be a crunch for ordinary folks. That crunch will come from perhaps the electricity or gas tariffs, as well as the GST being increased, as well as key items having more taxes on them, such as tobacco. A lot of people use tobacco. So overall, yes, the commodity percentage increase 
inflation hopefully will come down. And that has to do with global uh, forces like energy prices and stuff. But at the same time, we are putting in measures that won't be necessarily conducive to the comfort of the ordinary consumer immediately, insofar as we are conforming. So it's a kind of a mixed bag. And that's just the way it's going to be. So, and as far as, you know, it's not going to have any effects on the stabilization of dollar because we saw for a while that dollar has been relatively stable, uh, you know, with regard to strengthening of the rupee and whether the dollar will correspondingly go down, that having its effects on inflation or there are no uh, effects uh, for, for the common man. Oh, this is a very interesting point. So as you have notably um, mentioned, the rupee has been stable for about eight months, and that's very good. But inflation was not stable, and inflation was pretty high. And the number was in the uh, higher double digits of, uh, let's say, 20% plus. And, and uh, yet, so there was no particular correlation. That's why the IMF now says that you have to go towards a market-determined exchange rate. But as we spoke last time, uh, just diving into the market is not the most sensible thing when you're in a market of speculators. So we have a disaggregation a split between our currency and its movement versus inflation and its movement. Both indicators are good right now because inflation is coming down. The last monthly read year on year was positive, is it favorable, it's coming down. And at the same time, the rupee is in that proper bandwidth. Going forward, if we are going towards managed, uh, market determined rate as opposed to managed, then you will find that the depreciation will proceed on its normal course. The normal course has been about 7% per year historically. And inflation should come down, which will make it easier. But then again, as we just said, there will be program elements that will put a crunch on people's spending, such as electricity or GST. So you see the program now concentrating on increasing, for example, the power tariff in terms of the utilities overall. Um, and what other areas do you think that, broadly speaking, are we looking at perhaps a clamping down on taxation, increasing the bracket as far as the government is concerned? Of course, one of the considerations that the government will necessarily have is trying to make sure that the burden isn't so much on the lower segment of society. No, oh, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Let's put it this way. We have to, because the way we are conversing, it suggests that the IMF is telling us what to do, but actually the IMF says that Pakistan should give its recommendations. And then Pakistan says, well, we could work on this or that. And there's always priorities that are given. So for example, since the power sector hemorrhages so much, that often comes up. Similarly, the tax base being so narrow, that often comes up. But it isn't necessary that this would have been the path forward. But we do have to tackle this for our benefit in the longer run anyways. We do have to have greater breadth in the tax debt. We also have to look at not just tax, but the expenditure. What are you taxing people for? And then we also have to look at what we are importing and exporting. And then we have to look at how we generate energy in society and how it is distributed and how it is consumed. So the, it's not necessarily that the IMF is hanging over with specific recommendations, but since we it asks us to bring things and then it comments that perhaps you should do a little bit more of this and a little bit less of that. So it's a two-way conversation. Let's keep that in but, mind. But Osman, what about there is, you know, uh, this privatization that we are looking at, that this initiative of the government to move forward and, you know, deal with the white elephant issue and, of course, you know, deal with generally privatizing state-owned enterprises. Will that have any effect also or no? Y yes, it will. Um, it's tragic, you know, because these state-owned enterprises could create a lot of public value in principle and they were created for reasons and some of them go back a long way. But the fact is that because we do not have the political will to resolve things indigenously, we require some exogenous force to get things done. And I will draw your attention to the parallel of what FATF, FATF used to do, where it made it very tough for us on AML and CFT. So specific areas of financial oversight and we did do those, and we did them better than most countries now, better than developed countries, but we wouldn't have done it alone. So similarly, the push with the IMF now, that push is there for us to make reforms on SOEs so that now the private sector has bigger involvement, management is more efficient, labor management relations are resolved in a non-political manner, efficiencies are created, synergies are realized. There's all of these things that are possible, unfortunately, without some push to have private sector involvement, and that is facilitated by the IMF's emphasis on SOEs. But in principle, it wouldn't need to be done. It's just tragic that it has to happen this way.
But what about um, this, you know, consumer impact? I, are, you know, when we talk about uh, things like investment, we've seen this latest foray uh, into, uh, you know, countries like you know, our liaison with countries like Saudi Arabia, our constant engagement, the efforts the government is making. Is that going to translate into anything tangible? Is that going to have an effect on the economy also, um, you know, for the consumer, for the common man, in terms of, you know, as far as businesses are concerned, as far as our local businesses are concerned? Uh, yes, it's probably going to have a positive impact in the sense that having more investment and more capital deployed in Pakistan then helps to have more economic activity here. So that has a labor issue and employment issue, which is good. It may also generate secondary private sector investments. And it also gives a positive signal for other investors interested in emerging markets, broadly speaking, that this country is pretty stable and it's moving in the right direction. So there are second order positive effects. Now it depends how much investment we get, how quickly we get it and how lasting it is. So it's not just a short term thing rolled over, pulled out, but rather some meaningful long term projects. And then the second order effects can have a positive thing for the common person in terms of jobs, in terms of prices, in terms of other second order effects like their businesses rising and so on. So yeah, it can be a very good thing, absolutely. As far as, you know, we talk about projected tariff increase, I mean, um, it's going to it, it's going to seem like a all round, but you know, I'm trying to get in basically a cross section of what the economy will look like for the common man. As far as IMF and you know, like you said, the electricity being an issue and, and the power tariffs and price hikes there, do you think the projected tariff increase is something that is going to be particularly concerning? Yes, it is. If you're aiming to build a cross section like this, then I think we are tackling this in the right way by looking at the key crisis areas and the key decisions being made. SOEs, as we have just said, is an important one. Bringing in investment is another positive one. The power sector is probably one that is going to be troublesome because the way that we have locked into contracts or we have generation architecture, it isn't necessarily conducive to cheap energy. It also isn't re necessarily renewable energy. Then the costs are increasing to rationalize it in a manner that if you cannot get payments from everyone, that you get enough payments from the people in the grid, that you can keep it sustainable. So our power sector has become uh, a big uh, crisis uh, or an area which is a, what you would call a wicked problem. In the same way that the United States has healthcare as a wicked problem. Everyone seems to have this healthcare thing solved in the developed world, but the United States doesn't. Similarly, everyone seems to have this energy thing working just fine, but we seem to make a big crisis out of it. So the IMF is therefore looking at this very intently, that this hemorrhaging of this you know, circular debt and the expansion of payments and so on, is a big area. It has to be. So uh, now in terms of the areas of your cross-section, power is one that until you raise the rates, you're not going to be able to stem the tide of this constantly increasing debt, not just in electricity, but also in gas. So in the longer run, we have to think about the policies for renewables, how we distribute, what is the on-site versus off-site. A lot of the engineering stuff becomes a bit too important relative to just pure economics because energy is just the lifeblood of economics, but it isn't necessarily an economic subject, it's an engineering subject. So that makes it very tricky in terms of your cross-section. But, but so what's the good news for us in the next couple of months? Is there any good news? Well, that's a tricky one. It's a, it's, it's a very ugly world right now. I mean, maybe there'll be less um, genocide happening. Maybe there's less conflict I, I happening. I meant economically. I meant economically. Yes, yes, I understand what you mean. And uh, th that has economic ramifications too, because energy prices are influenced by conflict and so on. So, or maybe the elections happening in the U.S. lead to some stability for the world. So, uh, yes, I understand that you mean specifically economically. Mm -hmm. But good news, it's a very rough world out there. And it is driven by conflict and uncertainty and turbulence. Uh, and so indigenously, well, let's hope for the best. I do. I can tell you that we have a lot of competent people here. And there are a lot of well-meaning people here. 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis the economy. There's a way to stabilize things, certainly. Thank you so much, Osman. Thank you for your very valuable input. Thank you for being with us today. Overall, as far as economy is concerned, certainly there is, like Usman said, massive, massive effort underway to stabilize things as far as Pakistan is concerned. Of course, the negotiations with the IMF are a case in point. A, a further, a, a program of a longer duration to stabilize things, deal with perhaps privatization, things like this, which will, in the long run, move towards a more stable Pakistan, which will then translate towards uh, less inflation and perhaps a trickle-down effect for, uh, you know, the, the lowest segment of society seems to be the focus here. Let's hope that we can move towards that. Thank you so much for joining us today on First Week.